What is up guys, this is the second part in our Kalman filter series where we build up on our intuitive understanding from part one and introduce something called an alpha beta filter. A Kalman filter is actually an alpha beta filter with some more assumptions and some more upgrades so to speak. But before we start talking about the alpha beta filter, let's do a quick recap of what we did in the previous video. In the previous video, we built an intuitive understanding of what a Kalman filter is. Summing it up quickly, a Kalman filter is a tool for you to estimate the state where you already have a sensor, but the sensor is noisy. Because the world is not perfect, you won't have a perfect sensor where you get the right values of your estimate. So using an inherent model, inherent mathematical model, and the values from your sensors, you get a better estimate of your state. In each iteration, this Kalman filter has two steps. One is state predict, where we use the internal mathematical model. And the second step is your state update. This is where you use your sensor measurements to improve the values you got from your previous step, which was state predict. And once you're done with that, you get your state estimate of that iteration. A Kalman filter is a recursive filter where you have multiple iterations and each iteration is a combination of your state predict and state update. So this keeps happening again and again for each time instance. Now, this was just a summary of what we did in the previous video. If you haven't seen the previous video and you don't have an intuitive understanding of what a Kalman filter is, please check out the first part of this series. Now, as I said, in this video, we will talk about an alpha beta filter. But why do we do that? Because a Kalman filter is a type of alpha beta filter with some more assumptions and some more upgrades. If you're slightly confused, don't worry about it because in this video, we will talk about the alpha beta filter, introduce the equations, have a numerical example as well. And in the next video, we will talk about how this relates to the Kalman filter formally. So everything should be clear by then. So let's look at the alpha beta filter, but we'll develop it using an example instead of just throwing jargon at you. Before we begin this example, this series on Kalman filter is made in collaboration with Matthias Mentelli. If you want to check out his profile or my profile on different social media channels, you can look at the description of this video. So here, let's look at an example to understand what an alpha beta filter is conceptually. And then we will continue this with the numerical example as well. In this example, you have a car that's moving in a straight line for simplicity. So only one dimension and you have an antenna that is capable of measuring the distance regardless of how far this car is. To measure the distance, the antenna sends a broadcast signal that is received by the car which sends it back. By the time difference, it is possible to derive the car's velocity as well. Using only math, how do we describe the system dynamic model for this example? This is how you would describe it, right? You have your position at n based on your position of the car at n minus one time instance plus delta t into the velocity at n minus one. Here we assume that the velocity of the car is constant between n minus one and n. Don't worry, the car is not literally supposed to move with constant velocity. It is an assumption we are doing right now for this set of equations, which actually is your state predict step. When we talk about your state update step in a minute, you will see that this assumption is corrected and you will get your updated velocity, even though right now for your state predict, you are assuming that the velocity is constant. Okay, so these are your set of equations for a constant velocity model. This is called, as I said, your state predict predict step. And these equations are your state extrapolation equations. I'm sure you know about what I'm saying from the previous video. The name state extrapolation equation is so because the system of equations extrapolates the current state to the next state. Here it is important to highlight that the system of equations varies from case to case as it depends on the system dynamics. There is a matrix notation for a general state extrapolation equation, but we'll go through it only in the next video. Now, as I said, this is your state predict step. If we add numbers to these, let's assume that the antenna is capable of measuring the car's distance every two seconds. So we will have your state predict and state update step for delta t equals two, so every two seconds. Besides that, we say that the initial distance was zero, so x naught equals to zero meters. And estimated car velocity, which is constant for your state uh, predict step, right now is 55 meters per second. So based on these numbers, these are the values you will get. X hat one of zero, which is your prediction for time instance one based on time instance zero is equal to zero plus two into 55, which is equal to 110 meters. Now, what about the velocity? Your velocity, which is X dot hat one comma zero, which is your velocity for time instance one based on time instance zero will be 55 meters per second because we assumed that the velocity doesn't change between these two time steps. 
This was your state predict step. So you have your position or distance for time t equals one and your velocity. This was your prediction. Now let's go to the state update step. Let's say at this time instance one, the antenna measurement distance is equal to 95 meters and not 110 meters as expected from your state predict step. So there's a 15 meters difference between the predicted and the measurement distances. In this scenario, there are two possible reasons, right? One, the antenna measurements are not precise or two, the car has changed its velocity between measurements. So the new velocity would be this. Which one of this should be true? Let's see. This is your state update equation for your car position. This is how you get x hat n comma n, which is the position at time instance n based on your prediction from time instance n. This is equal to your prediction plus alpha into the difference between the measurement value you got and the prediction. And based on this distance, you accommodate for the difference between your measurement value and your predicted value. Alpha can be calculated for each iteration, which could be one by n, but we assume that alpha is constant in this example. In summary, the magnitude of alpha depends on antenna measurement precision. If you know that your measurement value or your sensor measurement is more precise, you will give a higher value to alpha. In the extreme case, if alpha equals to one, you will actually have your x hat n comma n equals to z of n. So for time instance n, your measurement value is the actual value of your estimate. That makes sense, right? Because if you say alpha equal to one, you have full faith in your measurement, but you do not have a lot of faith in your uh, prediction. On the other hand, if alpha equals to zero, you have full faith in your uh, prediction, but you don't have any faith in your measurement. So in that case, your measurement is actually doing nothing and you'll have x hat n comma n equal to x hat n comma n minus one, which was your prediction here. And applying alpha equal to zero and alpha equal to one respectively, you'll have these two values. If you say alpha equals to zero, you are saying that you do not have any faith in your measurement values. And if you say alpha equals to one, you say you do not have any faith in your prediction values. Now this alpha factor has been introduced. So this is one generic equation for your state update step. What about the other equation for your velocity? Because our state includes both your position and your velocity here. This will be the state update equation for your velocity. You have your difference in measurements and if you divide it by delta t, you will get the difference in your velocity between your measurement and your predicted value. The value of beta is again associated with the precision level of your antenna. Again, if you have a lot of faith in your antenna or your measurement, then beta will be high. Otherwise, it will be low. Let's say you have quite a bit of faith in your antenna for the measurement. So beta equals 0.9. Based on that, this should be your equation and these should be your numbers. If this doesn't make sense, please pause this video and check this out. You also have a full blog, which is the textual version of this video, where you can look at this with all the time you need. I would highly recommend doing that. That would make things so much more clear. On the other hand, let's say you know that your antenna measurements do not have a lot of precision. In that case, you will set your beta to a lower value because you will say that you do not trust your measurement value so much, but you trust your prediction more than your measurement at least. So these are the two equations with two values of beta and they give you different values of your velocity. So now you see that although in your state predict step, we assume that the velocity of the car was constant, the velocity changes here, right? That's why I was saying that your state update step takes care of your state values, even though some of them or one of them have been assumed to be constant. In this case, we are talking about velocity because we assume that the velocity of your uh, car is constant in your state predict step. Please bear in mind that I'm saying state predict step. And in your state update step, we still change the velocity because of course the velocity changed. It is the real world. In an ideal world, you can say that your velocity is constant, so with this analysis, we have come up with a system of equations that compose the state update equation for the antenna. The system is also called the alpha beta track update equations or alpha beta track filtering equations. Again, these are your state update equations for position and velocity, which together form your state. So finally, you have your state predict equations, which are these and your state update equations, which are these. In a real Kalman filter, both alpha and beta are replaced by the Kalman gain which is calculated at each iteration. Here in this example, we have chosen the values, but in the next videos, we are going to learn how to compute the Kalman gain when we introduce the Kalman filter properly. So this is what an alpha beta filter is. We've used an example to introduce your alpha beta filter instead of just throwing jargons at you. What you see on the screen is a summary of your alpha beta filter. You use your inherent idea of the dynamic system model in your state predict step 
and in your state update step you use alpha and beta to accommodate for the difference in your measurement values versus the predicted values this allows you to have a better estimate of your state now that you have a good idea of your alpha beta filter let's continue with this example and do multiple iterations to see how the state actually evolves with time in that way we'll also be able to plot a graph and see what's happening and how an alpha beta filter is able to estimate the value of your state which is your position and velocity in a much better way than just using your measurement values or just using an inherent model so if we start this example all over again at time equal to zero you have your initialization and we say that the position of the car is zero and the velocity of the car is assumed to be 55 meter per second that is constant for this iteration. A time instance equal to one, you will have your state predict step, which is this. Please bear in mind that I am saying time instance t equals one, which is actually delta t equals to two because our sensor measurement is happening every two seconds. So please don't get confused by that. Delta t equals to two, but t equals to one means that time step. So t is actually for your time step, not your time difference. Based on these mathematical equations for your predict step, which is just simple laws of motion, you get your position of the car for the next time step as 110 meters. So time step one for your predict equals 110 meters and your velocity of course is 55 meters per second because that is our assumption. Constant velocity between time step equals to zero and time step equals one. This means this is the result of your predict step, 110 meters and 55 meters per second. Now. What is the second step of your iteration? The second step of this iteration for time instance equals to one is your update step. So let's suppose the antenna measurement is 89 meters. Then we compute the current distance using the state update equation. We are using constant alpha and beta values 0.2 and 0.1 respectively. So these are your estimates after your state update. This calculation should now be very evident and I'm sure there is no issue here. If you're still confused, please look at the blog. You can read through the blog again and again. It's more descriptive and it'll help you much more. Now we do the same at time instance two. This is your predict step and this is your measurement value and this is your update step. Here again, it is self-evident after we did it in the previous one. Here we've used the same logic for time instance two. We are using laws of motion for your predict step and we use the previous value of our estimates. Again, here we assume that the velocity is constant between one and two. Since we got the estimate of our velocity from our previous time step as 53.95 meters per second, that is what we use. And that velocity is constant between time step one and two. Now your measurement value is 185 meters and you have your update step. After your update step two, you see your estimate of your position and your velocity again. Now we keep doing this again and again for different time steps. So this is a recursive process and this is what we see. So this is your set of equations and your results for time instance equals to three. The next one is for four and so on and so forth. These are the final numbers based on all these calculations. If you want to spend time calculating, you can spend time calculating for all the time instances. You can also look at the blog. I'm again saying that the blog is very helpful and you can spend all the time on the blog, which has everything I'm talking about. Now, based on this chart, we have an estimate of your position and your velocity for each time instance. Let's plot this to also understand this. This is the graph for what we just did when you had alpha equals 0.2 and beta equals 0.1. You see that the ground truth is the green one. That is something we don't know in our calculations, right? That is the absolute truth. Your prediction is the blue one, which is after your state predict step in each iteration. So before you actually account for any measurement values, your measurement is just your measurement values and your estimate is the value you get after each iteration. So the final value after you combine your state predict and state update. You see that the estimate is very close to your ground truth, even though the measurement values are changing. Here you set alpha equals 0.2 and beta equals to 0.1. So this is the graph you get. You see that the estimate value is very close to the ground truth, so you're happy. But what happens if we change the values of alpha and beta to 0.8 and 0.4 respectively? If we do that, in both state update equations for distance and velocity, we are going to trust the measurement values more. It means that your estimate will be closer to your measurement values than it was in the previous graph. Using the same set of calculations, this is the graph you will get. Here you see that the ground truth is the same, but if you see your estimate is actually following your measurement values more, right? That is because we are trusting our measurement values more. If you spend some time looking at the calculation and relating that to the graph, you will understand why this is happening. 
based on these two charts, you might be wondering whether we should always use low values for alpha and beta, right? However, it is important to mention that these values depend on the measurement precision. When using high precision hardware, it is recommended to use a high value for both alpha and beta as the prediction and estimation should follow the precise measurements taken by the sensor. On the other hand, if you're using a poor quality sensor, the values of alpha and beta should be low and the filter is going to smooth the uncertainty in these measurements. So in summary, using an alpha beta filter helps you find a better estimate of your state. It all depends on your alpha and beta. Now, how does that relate to your Kalman filter? As I said before, a Kalman filter is an alpha beta filter with some more upgrades, some more assumptions, and also alpha and beta values are not constant. They are calculated at each time step. A Kalman filter is a huge upgrade to your alpha beta filter, but conceptually the alpha beta filter is the base for you to understand Kalman filter later. And here are some more considerations for your alpha beta filter. Choosing the values for alpha and beta in the filter needs analysis. Filters are designed not selected ad hoc. The same applies to the state extrapolation equation that models the system. It is important to understand the problem well to design the filter. And as mentioned before, state predict and state update steps are both crucial for good estimation. I hope with this, you have an example-based understanding of what an alpha beta filter is. Since that is done, we will now move on to the base filter and then the Kalman filter. So in the next video, we will introduce the base filter and then relate it to what we just saw right now, which is the alpha beta filter. And after that, we move to the Kalman filter formally. Once that is done, we will of course also implement a Kalman filter from scratch in Python. So I will see you in the next video. Hope this was interesting and useful. Bye-bye.